Oh, yeah, indeed. All right. Well, everyone, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to make it in tonight. Um, tonight's lecture is on genitally urinary rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, and um, this is a topic that I found uh, personally intimidating me when I was a resident um, and a fellow for that matter. And so hopefully the goal of tonight is for coming out of this for you to be a lot more comfortable with it because certain aspects of it can be confusing and intimidating, but I promise it's all very easy. Uh, in terms of disclosures, I am a member of the Children's Oncology Group um, Surgery Committee, the Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee, a few of the long-term follow-up committees, and also the current Intermediate Risk Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee study. Um, uh, and just to be clear, the views expressed are mine. They are not necessarily those of COG, but I do not own stock in uh, rhabdomyosarcoma.com or anything along those lines, I promise. So in terms of kind of what we're going to go over tonight, first, I wanted to, to hit on a quick pretest um, for those of you who are coming in, and it looks like we've got about 29 odd folks in tonight. Um, this is the part where you come in. I actually do want to get a response from you and hopefully engage you a little bit in this and, and not necessarily test you, but just kind of get you thinking about what are some of the issues with, uh, with rhabdo. We'll talk a little bit about epidemiology, staging, and risk group because those are the things that tend to confuse folks. Um, some of the basic surgical principles and as surgeons, how we contribute to the care of these children with rhabdo. Um, I'll gloss over pathology because that occasionally comes up on tests. Uh, and then we'll talk about briefly some GU uh, specific site specific concepts as well. So, to begin the beginning, let's assume for the sake of argument that you are in clinic and you have a 14-year-old boy who comes in to see you with a palpable right scrotal mass. Um, so, if you don't mind, just log on to the chat and chat to everyone and, and let me know what's in your differential and what's your most likely diagnosis. And I'll give everyone about like two seconds to think about that. Um, but... I really do mean this, actually, if you could actually put in a chat uh, or, or kind of let me know what you're thinking, I'd appreciate it. Or for that matter, if you want to just comment. So you choose to get a CT scan, uh, and this is what you see. And the pertinent points here are you're not supposed to have a big heterogeneous mass or a smaller heterogeneous mass uh, sitting in the middle of your belly. 14-year-old uh, boys are definitely not supposed to have big honking lumps uh, in the, uh, the side of their testicle. And again, this is just another uh, view of that uh, very large lump that this little guy had. Based upon this, you choose to get some further imaging. And based on this PET scan, I don't know how many of you are, are uh, you know, used to visualizing PET scans, but I'll give you a hint. You're not supposed to have bright spots in the middle of your spine. So what does a PET scan like this do in terms of changing your stage, your risk group, excuse me, your group or your risk category overall? You do a biopsy of it, and this is what you see. And the question that you want to think here about is, what's the most likely pathological subtype for a peritosic rhabdo, particularly one that has these kinds of striations that you would see there? The next case I want you to think about is a six-year-old female. She comes in to see you with grossy materia. Again, what's your differential diagnosis for this kid? Probably includes a UTI, probably includes some various other things that, you know, maybe a hemoglobinopathy or a, um, uh, a nephropathy of some kind, nephritis. Um, but what's your most likely diagnosis based on this information? And does that change once you see this on physical exam? I'll give you a hint. That's not normal. You choose to get some imaging tests, actually the ER will do this one. Uh, and based on this, and based on, again, I assume we've all seen VCGs before, you're not supposed to have filling defects on the VCG. What is the stage, what is the group, and what is the risk category for this patient? You do a biopsy, and again, this is what you see. So what's the most likely pathological subtype? The last kid for, uh, for the pretest section is, this is a three-year-old boy who comes into your office and mom says he is straining to urinate. He's really having a tough time. It's been getting worse over the last week to two weeks. So this is a question that our residents struggle with quite a bit. What is the term for straining to urinate? Yes, as a urologist, we have a term for that. And when you have a three or a four or five-year-old boy who comes into your office and mom says he cannot pee, he really has to push hard, 
in this one situation, this is something where you have to assume this child has a problem until proven otherwise. And what do you do want to do in terms of further workup for this young man? I'll give you a hint. In this case, I got a CT scan, and this is what it showed. This is his bladder. This is not. This is something coming off the base of the bladder and the prostate gland, which is obviously quite elevated. And the question is, what do you want to do for this little man? Do you want to give him some chemotherapy? Do you want to give him radiation? Do you immediately take him to the OR and do a cystectomy and a conduit? Do you think, no, I want this boy to be conduit or a continent? So we're going to do a cystectomy and neobladder. Do you want to do an open biopsy of this tumor? Do you want to do a transurethral biopsy of this tumor? Or do you want to do some combination thereof? I'll give you a hint. In this case, four years later, I actually still follow up with this little guy on a regular basis. This is his bladder. It's still in situ. He's still got a small residual mass that's still there. But overall, he's got a little bit of urgency and frequency, otherwise doing great. So let's talk for a moment about the epidemiology of rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. So in terms of general pediatric tumors, this is, and let's be honest here, all pediatric tumors are rare, right? So this is on the more rare end of things. So leukemias, lymphomas, those types of things, in general, when you add them all together, these account for, depending on what study you read, somewhere between 25 and 30% of all pediatric malignancies, roughly 5,500 patients per year. Brain tumors are the second largest group. There's, depending on how you count those, somewhere between two and 4,000 per year. Among the tumors that we see more of, uh, neuroblastoma is the most common abdominal solid tumor malignancy. Um, that's going to be about 750 per year. Wilms tumor, roughly 500 per year. If you add in all renal cancers, that's about 600 per year. Rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is a little bit less frequent, about 350 per year, which puts in the realm of hepatoblastoma. Testis tumors, by, um, by comparison, have about 200 per year, and they're actually even more rare than, than these. So again, it's the third most common solid abdominal tumor following neuroblastoma and Wilms. There's about 350 cases per year annually, and depending upon the year, roughly 15 to 20 percent of these arise from the GU system. And specifically, they come from the paratysticular region, the bladder and the prostate, or vulvovaginal tumors, and occasionally get them arising from the pelvis, and they're so big you can't quite tell where they're coming from. And it's important to realize that these have a bimodal age distribution. The peak instance is actually less than two years of life. There's a second peak that's a little bit smaller in adolescence. And roughly two thirds of these cases will occur in children younger than six years of age. So again, this is the part that most folks tend to be a little bit worried about. This is where we get into staging, group, and risk category. And so this is where I'm gonna spend a, kind of an inordinate amount of time to make sure that these concepts kind of stick home because again, they can be intimidating, but I wanna make sure that you guys can kind of get the basic concepts. So let's be blunt. Staging is really confusing when you actually are looking at this. Again, I distinctly remember as a second year resident trying to take my, uh, my in-service exam and trying to figure out what in the devil is going on with this and finally throwing up my hands in the air and saying, yeah, I'm not gonna get this this year. But here's the thing, if you actually understand the basic concepts, it's a lot more straightforward than it seems on first glance. And the dumbed down version is, preoperatively, you can assess the stage for the patient. Not the TNM stage, different kind of stage, I'm gonna tell you about it in a minute. Postoperatively, that's where we get into the grouping of that. And when you know the stage and you know the group, you can add those together and get the risk category overall. And that's gonna be high, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk, that simple. High risk, low risk, in between, easy enough. So let's talk for a moment about staging. Stage, stages run one through four, very similar to other types of cancers. In general, a stage one tumor is going to come from a favorable site. It can be of any size whatsoever, as long as there's relatively small nodal involvement. So N0 or N1 disease based upon the TNM staging system. In the genital urinary system, we're talking about paratistic ear tumors here. Um, other types of, of, uh, uh, of sites also count as favorable. So for example, if it's around the orbit, that counts as a favorable site. Um, but in general, in the GU system, we're limited here to paratistic ear tumors. Stage two is gonna be unfavorable sites. Those are gonna be specifically unfavorable sites that are relatively small, less than five centimeters in size. And decades ago, five centimeters was established as the cutoff where we actually make our, our, um, uh, our, our uh, uh, threshold for whether we worry about these tumors or not. And specifically in stage two, there has to be no evidence of nodal involvement. They have to be N0 on imaging. 
Here we're looking at the bladder and the prostate. Now the catch is, is that bladder prostate tumors generally tend to present when they're large. So it's relatively uncommon to come up with a stage two bladder prostate tumor because oftentimes they're gonna rock in at six centimeters, 10 centimeters, 12 centimeters to begin with. And frequently they'll have nodal involvement as well. So they will be N1 um, on their, their initial assessment. Stage three is probably the most common type of tumor that I see sitting on the, the COG soft tissue sarcoma committee. Um, these are again are rising from an unfavorable site such as bladder and prostate. Um, these are going to be larger than five centimeters or they can have involvement of the lymph node, so N1 disease. Stage four, as you'd expect for any stage four cancer, is one that has widespread disease. So if you think back to that 14 year old boy with paratesticular tumor that I showed at the beginning, that's a young man with, that's right, stage four disease. He started out with a paratesticular tumor, which is favorable. However, the PET scan showed involvement of his spine. If you have metastasized to bone, by definition, you have stage four disease. So easy peasy, stage is relatively straightforward. You really just simply, for the, quite frankly, for the sake of, of what we're talking about here, you need to know, does it come from the testicle? Does it from, come from the bladder and prostate? And quite frankly, that is going to cover the grand majority of the patients that you're gonna see, and also the situation you're gonna encounter, for example, on an in-service test or a board test, that type of thing. If you know those two things, you're basically golden. Grouping is where we get a little bit more interesting because this is surgeons is where we actually get to play a role. Group one tumors. This is not stage, this is group. And remember, those two things are independent. Group one tumors are organ confined um, and they have negative margins. So for example, if you have a paratesticular tumor, um, then basically you can see that this will be something which you can go in, you can excise, uh, and with relatively you know, negative margins, that type of thing, congratulations, you got yourself a favorable site, which means it's stage one. It was organ confined, but you excised with negative margins, congratulations. That means that you actually have a stage one, group one disease that will be low risk. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Group two is where you performed a gross total resection, but you had, for example, a microscopically positive margin, or the tumor is just too big, so you had to take it out piecemeal fashion. As soon as you do that, that's going to bump you into a group two situation. Or if you have positive lymph nodes, that's also gonna bump you into a group two. Group three is where you have simply an incomplete resection. Let's assume, for example, looking back with the young man that I mentioned, the three-year-old boy, uh, who actually had the very, very large uh, bladder prostate tumor. That's a kid where you're not going to be able to excise that without taking out his bladder and probably his prostate, and who knows, maybe something else too. And so in that situation, it's reasonable. In fact, the standard of care is to go in and do a biopsy of that, either open or change urethrally. And then once you've done that, because it's an incomplete resection, you've established a diagnosis by doing the biopsy, but it's an incomplete resection. So that means he's a group three tumor. Now in that case, and the three-year-old boy that I mentioned before, that was coming from an unfavorable site and it was greater than five centimeters in size. Therefore, it's a stage three, group three tumor. Make sense? And group four, again, just as with stage, if you have widespread bony metastases, congratulations, you got yourself a group four tumor. And what's important, very important to know here is, this is all determined prior to chemotherapy. The moment you give chemotherapy, the risk groups, or in this case, the groups overall, are locked in. And I'll explain them again in a minute here, the importance of that. So now that we know the basics of staging and the basics of grouping, let's talk for a moment uh, about risk categories and how those two come together. So sarcoma risk categorization is interesting. It's a little bit different actually than most types of tumors that we talk about because this implies that the risk category is both dependent upon biology, what the tumor itself did, and the surgical outcomes, what we as surgeons have done to this patient and hopefully done for this patient. Again, you can break this down into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. The risk category, again, is gonna depend upon the stage, which is primarily location and size. Group, you notice that's in blue. That means that's a part that we actually contribute to. What's the spread of the disease? What's the extent of the surgical resection? It also, to a certain extent, depends upon the cancer type. We'll talk about that when I talk about pathology. Specifically, is this a fusion tumor or a non-fusion tumor? And ultimately, this risk 
is going to be what defines our ability to define local control and also what kind of chemotherapy that they get and how much chemotherapy that they get. So this is really the meat of the talk here, surgical goals for randomized sarcoma. We're surgeons, this is what we do. So what exactly are our goals? What are we attempting to accomplish for these patients? And it really comes down to two things. Number one, we're trying to establish a diagnosis and we are trying to establish and improve the prognosis for the patient. So under diagnosis, you'll note that I have get information and specifically what I mean there is, this is where we do a biopsy of a large bladder prostate tumor, which we don't think is necessarily going to be uh, able to be excised with negative margins without taking out something else nasty. This is where we consider doing a lymph node dissection. For example, uh, at the SPU uh, meeting coming up at the end of this month, uh, I'll be discussing the most recent uh, paper out of the Children's Oncology Group Sar Sarcoma Committee dealing with the role of retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in paratisticular tumors. To cut to the chase, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection does not change the prognosis for these patients, or does not appear to at least. Um, however, it does establish a diagnosis and it lets you know, is this someone with widespread lymph node involvement who's going to need further radiation, or is this someone that we can take care of with just chemotherapy? The second thing that we're trying to do, and the second goal of uh, rado surgery, is to improve our patient's prognosis. That includes quality of life, that includes quantity of life. The key factor here is there's two ways that you can get local control. What I mean by that is the ways that you control the tumor, not the widespread metastases. That's on the chemotherapy, but local control is established by two ways alone, and that's surgery, and radiation oncology. And in general, rhodomyosis sarcoma makes liberal use of both of those. The whole goal of that teamwork is to establish local control because that in general is where these patients are going to recur. And that is going to ultimately be what leads them on to you know, a, a mortality or a late recurrence, that type of thing. The goal of this is to excise the tumor with negative margins. And what you're looking for here is ideally an R0 margin or R0 resection, but potentially an R1 resection. And what I mean by that is R0 means you uh, completely excise this with negative margins. R1 means you excise it with negative gross margins, but microscopically positive margins. An R2 resection means that you excise it, you left some tumor behind, you did the best you could, and there's still tumor left behind. I cannot stress enough, R2 resections are strongly discouraged in children with randomized sarcoma. The data is abundantly clear on, these, um, uh, on the, the situation that basically if you do an R2 resection and you leave tumor behind, you are not helping out your patient, you are actively hurting them. Um, and so ultimately the goal here is to excise the tumor so long as you can do that without a, what's deemed unacceptable loss of function or form. So for example, if you can avoid doing a cystectomy and taking out the patient's bladder, there's a benefit to that. Um, ultimately here though, the goal is to increase their survival and decrease their late effects. So this is where the terminology gets a little bit funny. Um, there are basically three um, abbreviations that get tossed around a good bit in randomized sarcoma, and they're worth knowing and worth kind of understanding the basic concepts, but unless you really are looking to get into the weeds of it, you don't necessarily need to remember these on a day-to-day -day basis, but they do occasionally come up, and the general concepts are important. So in general, surgeons, we can do the original biopsy, the original excision. We can do what's called a pre-treatment re-excision, which is often referred to as a pre or a PRE. What that means is, for example, you go in, you do a biopsy of the tumor, uh, or in the case of a peritonsicular tumor, for example, you go in and you do a radical orchiectomy, but you don't quite get all of the cord out. You then decide, you know what? I had a positive margin at the cord. I wanna make sure that I get all that out. And so you go back in before chemotherapy begins, and at that point, you re-excise the cord as high up as you can get it. You actually open up the internal ring and take it up very high with the internal ring. In that situation, that is a pre-treatment, pre-chemotherapy re-excision. That has the potential to change the risk group for the patient. If on that re-excision, you establish a negative margin, you've just bumped that patient back from a group three, which remember was a negative, was an incomplete resection, you bump them back to a group one, which means in the case of a paratisicular tumor, that bumps them into a low risk category, which means they get substantially less chemotherapy and they also do not get radiation. 
And so in that situation, that is a huge win for the patient, and that's potentially a very, very good thing for both their long-term prognosis and their long-term quality of life. A second option is something called a delayed primary excision. This is where you do a wide local re-excision after you have begun the chemotherapy. So for example, in the case of my three-year-old that I mentioned to you before with the bladder prostate, huge tumor, there's no way I can get that thing out with negative margins and preserving that boy's bladder and prostate and potentially have a negative impact on his urinary function and his sexual function long-term. And so in that situation, we choose to treat with chemotherapy and radiation. However, let's assume for the sake of argument that we wanted to maybe give him less radiation. Say it's an infant and you're very concerned about the potential damage to the hips that's going to come from a very large dose of radiation coming at the time of your radiation therapy. Let's assume that after chemotherapy, the tumor is shrunk enough that now you think you can re-excise it. And in that situation, that's a delayed primary excision or DPE. And the goal of this, again, I cannot stress this enough, is complete excision. If you really, truly, honestly think you can get the entire thing out with negative margins, not in a piecemeal manner, a DPE makes a lot of sense. If you do not think you can get this all out, do not do a DPE. Again, I can't stress this enough. There is no benefit to a DPE if you cannot get an R0 resection. So if you don't think you can do that, in fact, if you're not convinced you can do that, please don't bother trying to begin with because you will most likely harm the patient by putting them through an unnecessary surgery that doesn't bend their survival curve in the way you want it to bend. Occasionally, and this is an older term, you'll hear something called a second look procedure, an SLO. What that means in plain English basically is, for example, as a urologist, you want to go back and look at this bladder prostate rhabdo. Say that there is a polyp coming off this child's prostate gland, and you want to see whether or not it's still there. You go in, you see uh, with a, a cystoscopic examination whether or not there's something there. There's a little ditzel. You want to do a biopsy of it. That's a second look procedure. In general, these are discouraged unless the patient's having symptoms because they simply do not have, in fact, they've never been shown to change the survival curve in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and there's actually in the COG trials quite a few kids who have gone through a large number of these procedures uh, and none of them seem to have gotten any benefit. And so in general, we tend to discourage these unless you have a good reason to do it. So again, this is an important concept. That's why I'm stressing it. A pre pretreatment re-excision, you do your biopsy, you establish a diagnosis that was goal number one of surgery, then you decide maybe I can get this prognosis thing down too. So you excise the tumor in its entirety, you downstage that tumor and downgroup that tumor, excuse me, and then you give chemotherapy. There is very clear data showing that this improves survival, and if this is possible, you should do it. For example, if you have a bladder dome tumor, that you think you can get out with negative margins. And bladder dome is kind of, bladder dome and extremity are actually kind of the canonical example for a pre is a really great idea. Um, if you can get this out completely, do it. It's great. Patients will love you for it. They'll get a lot less chemotherapy and a lot less radiation. DPE, or a delayed primary excision, you do your biopsy, then you give chemo. And again, remember what I said before, as soon as you give chemotherapy, stage, group, and risk category are locked in. You cannot change them. Therefore, they're gonna get the same amount of chemotherapy afterwards but you can potentially reduce their radiation therapy by giving them another form of local control, in this case, excision. If you can excise it in its entirety, this is reasonable if it's a low morbidity type of procedure. Quick word about lymph nodes. Um, the initial biopsy uh, for lymph nodes or the initial biopsy for the tumor is entirely re uh, reasonable to do this endoscopically or percutaneously. Um, if you were going to be doing an open procedure, for example, you're going to be doing an open biopsy of a bladder prostate or a pelvic tumor, then while you're there, please make them take a moment to sample the iliac or the periortics or some other node system uh, chain that you can get a hold of easily. That again is simply a way to get more information, goal one of our surgery. We want to establish a diagnosis and get more information. Sentinel node biopsy is something that is actively being looked into. Uh, there are a lot of folks who actually are big proponents of this. Primarily, most of them are uh, pediatric general surgeons. Um, but there's a lot of data that is beginning to emerge that suggests that this may actually be a great idea, and it may be a worthwhile endeavor for all of us to do more of. Again, right now in the generative urinary sphere, we really don't have enough data to really give a good um, uh, answer about whether or not this works. In extremities, it works very well. But again, on the GU side of things, we just simply don't have enough data to know yet. If the pelvic nodes 
are enlarged or if they're clinically positive, by all means, please do try and sample some tissue from there. Again, it's gonna give you more information. And specifically for paratistic rhabdo, if you're gonna be, um, uh, if you have a patient who is either has clinically positive nodes or N1 disease, or if you have a child who is greater than 10 years old, again, my 14-year-old boy that I mentioned before, an ipsilateral template RPLND in general is strongly suggested for these patients. And the goal here is to get between seven and 13 nodes positive. There's gonna be seven and 13 nodes total. So let's talk for a moment now and shift gears for a moment on pathology. I'm not gonna quiz you too much on this, um, but the basic concepts are ones that are important again. So pathology all derives and was originally defined by the intergroup Rhabdomyosarcoma study group. And this is IRS um, studies one through four. And so if you ever hear about these, um, the IRS studies, this is not the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, this is actually the intergroup Rhabdomyosarcoma study group. Um, that group in early to late 90s, early 2000s, was actually folded into the children's oncology group when the pediatric oncology group, the Wilms tumor study group, and the IRS study group all merged together to form COG. IRS became the COG sarcoma committee. Uh, and this group has a long history of having urologists uh, serving on this. Um, uh, myself and Candace Granberg are the, the two urologists currently on the committee. Point is, is that there are three major histologic groups that you will see defined initially by IRS that show up um, in these tumors. You have embryonal tumors, you have alveolar tumors, and you have pleomorphic or undifferentiated tumors. In general, these are this last group, the latter group, the pleomorphic tumors, are not going to be seen in the GU tract. These are extremely rare uh, in the GU tract, much, much, much more common in other locations, for example, again, extremity. What's interesting is within the last 10 years, there's really been a, a kind of a revolutionary re-envisioning of the way that we think about pathology for these patients. We have what you show up, shows up on pathology, excuse me, on histology, and that's embryonal and alveolar. For, for GU tumors, those are really the two big things that you need to know. But what's interesting is there are alveolar tumor children who do well and alveolar tumor children who do really poorly. The question is, why? And it turns out that actually that's really all because of one gene. Uh, well, two genes, either Pax3 fusion gene or Pax7 fusion gene. It turns out that actually if you are an alveolar tumor, which is fusion negative, you behave just like an embryonal tumor. You have the exact same chance of long-term cure as an embryonal tumor. Um, if you have uh, a, um, uh, a alveolar tumor, which is fusion positive, you do poorly. And so the point is, is that nowadays, rather than referring to embryonal tumors or alveolar tumors, we generally tend to refer more to fusion positive or fusion negative tumors. We also hear a lot about something called sarcoma botryoides. Um, what that means, again, in plain English, basically is you got a tumor that looks just like a bunch of grapes. That's where the name comes from. And specifically, there are a bunch of grapes that pop out of an organ of some kind. Classically, it's out of the bladder uh, or out of the vulvovaginal uh, area. This is what it looks like on VCG. Again, here on VCG, you can see this poor little girl has a classic spinning top urethra. What is non-classic here is the fact that you should not be able to see tumor prolapsing down through her urethra as she's trying to void. That's why this little girl had grossing material because she had a very turbulent flow and it stretched the walls of her urethra. That's also why this little girl had severe strangularia because she couldn't pee around this tumor. It was just like a median lobe in a prostate. And on MRI, this is the same little child. This is what it looks like. Again, you have normal wall bladder moving all the way around uh, and a pretty sizable tumor contained within it. And so in the case of this child, we actually went in and did a, this is a tumor that I took care of uh, as a fellow with, uh, with Rich Lee at uh, Boston Children's. And what we ultimately decided to do as a multidisciplinary uh, uh, tumor board team, we ultimately decided that in this young girl, radiation would have severe long-term impact on her quality of life and have some pretty nasty late effects for her potentially. And so the decision was made after a long discussion with tumor board and an even longer discussion with their parents to actually recommend that this child have a transurethral biopsy, which we did, and we confirmed that it was a rhabdosarcoma. We then chose to proceed uh, with a cystectomy. And the reason why is because, again, that's a pretreatment reexcision, And in this case, that would change her from stage three, group three, unfavorable tumor greater than five centimeters, stage three, 
group three tumor with an incomplete resection, that's gonna bump her back if you can have negative margins to a group one resection, which means that she's going to be low risk. She will not get radiation and she will get much, much, much less chemotherapy. Again, after a long discussion with this family, the decision was made that the short-term surgical side effects were worth it in order to prevent those longer-term side effects from more chemotherapy and more radiation. Again, that's an individual decision for this particular family, but it's a, the concept overall is what's important to understand. The genetics of retinoid sarcoma also bears mention. Um, leaf Romani syndrome is kind of classic for being one that predisposes to retinoid sarcoma in its in, uh, patients. Um, embryonal retinoid sarcoma um, is generally associated with loss of heterozygosity at 11p15. For those of you studying at home, hopefully you uh, notice that that looks a little bit familiar. That's where your WT2 gene uh, comes in, 11p15. 11p13 is where you get WT1. Alveolar retinoid sarcoma is also associated with the chromosome 13 translocation with chromosome 11. And again, that's where your, excuse me, chromosome 1 and 2. Um, and that, again, is where you see the PAX3 and the PAX7 fusion proteins begin to come in. The PAX3 fusion protein is in general associated with a worse prognosis than is PAX7, but both of them are considered to be fusion-positive tumors. Both of them are considered to worsen the prognosis overall for these, um, for these patients. Embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma in the genital urinary system is by far the most common subtype. That's a good thing because that's actually the one that we uh, generally think of as, again, as having the best prognosis. And so it is important to realize that in general, these kids, whoops, um, these kids do tend to do pretty well. This accounts for almost all, about 80% of genital urinary tumors. And this is what it looks like. Again, you can see here, you've got the classic strap cells. Um, and overall, a, a relatively you know, well-displaced um, uh, type of tumor and, and um, uh, relationship between the tumor and the, and the stroma. Alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is much more common at trunk and extremity tumors than GU locations. Um, and in general, it has a worse prognosis than embryonal tumors. But again, that's primarily due to the fact that these are fusion-positive tumors by and large. Fusion negative tumors in general will have a prognosis that is very similar to embryonal tumors. This is why in the current era we focus so strongly on fusion positive versus fusion negative tumors is because we're ultimately trying to, to not necessarily quiz you on what histopathology shows. We're more interested in what are the prognostic factors, the biological factors that are going to bend the survival curve in one direction or the other. And fusion positivity or fusion negativity is a big one in that regard. And this again is what it looks like. And you can see, there's a you know, much, much higher uh, nuclear cytoplasmic ratio for these tumors. They're dark blue. I don't remember much from pathology days in medical school, but I'm pretty confident I was told at some point or another that the darker and bluer it is, the worse the prognosis overall because the more aggressive the tumor is. And that's true for alveolar tumors in general. So how do these tumors present? The classic kind of canonical way that these uh, tumors are gonna present um, essentially is going to be dependent on the site. Bladder prostate, stranguria, stranguria, and stranguria. If a child shows up, and it's especially true for a three or a four or a five-year-old boy, shows up and is having a very difficult time urinating, and they're really straining to void, you need to feel their belly and make sure that you don't feel a palpable bladder or a palpable mass of some kind. Urinary retention, urinary urgency, and hematuria can also um, uh, be signs that these children show up with. In the vagina or the uterus, Vaginal bleeding uh, is the most common uh, situation that we see. In fact, I literally just got a call yesterday from, uh, from a pediatrician saying, hey, I've got a two-year-old little girl here and she's having some bleeding from her vagina. I well, could very well be that she was playing around with a crayon and it wound up getting stuck somewhere it wasn't supposed to be. But you have to make sure you don't miss a vaginal tumor in those situations. And so those parents, patients always need an evaluation and unfortunately, that's not something the current era we can do by video visit. You actually have to see them in clinic. So after a long discussion with the, the family, we're actually going to be doing an exam under anesthesia in this little girl to make sure we're not missing anything. These children can also, or this um, site can also, as I mentioned before, present with stranguria, particularly if it's sarcoma botryoides, that's actually um, pushing down and pushing on the, uh, the neck of the bladder, uh, or simply an introidal mass um, that's present when they valsalva. Uh, 
parasitic tumors, these are almost always going to show up with painless scrotal mass. If they present very late, which again, unfortunately, some of these um, uh, boys will literally sit on the tumor hoping it will go away on its own. In the case of my 14-year-old boy that I mentioned before, that's exactly what he did. He'd been sitting on it for about six or seven months before he actually brought it to mom's attention. And by that time, he actually had begun having back pain. Um, and so in general, early on especially, these are going to be painless scrotal masses, exactly like a testicular tumor. So for the last part of the talk here, I'd like to wrap up um, by going over what are some basic key points that you need to be aware of for each GU site, because as urologists, this is what we're going to see. So bladder and prostate tumors. Again, bladder should be preserved for most of these tumors. Um, in general, these tumors present very large, and in general, they are not going to be resectable at diagnosis. Um, particularly the prostatic and the, the uh, pelvic sidewall tumors are very, very difficult to excise um, from the beginning, simply because there's a lot of other stuff in the pelvis that can get in the way. Um, so in general, you're going to do a biopsy, either percutaneously or cystoscopically or open, and you are then going to refer them to radiation oncology for the, the dominant form of that local control. If you are going to an exenterate the patient um, and you do choose to do uh, that type of excision, my personal read of the data is that you're better off diverting them now and doing an ileal conduit or a colon conduit and then reconstructing them at a later date. Um, the reality is, is that this is not bladder cancer, urothelial cancer it's very difficult to have an informed consent discussion with a five-year-old about removing their bladder and giving them a conduit or the ins and outs of they may need to catheterize to empty their catheterizable channel or their neobladder and dealing with the long-term sexual side effects, for example, of doing a neobladder. Um, again, there's some significant problems there. Um, and so the reality is that if you look, for example, at the French and Italian data, there's pretty good data to show that you can do a continent neobladder in these patients, and in general, they will do okay. Um, but uh, if you actually read the most recent Italian series uh, that, uh, uh, that came out a few years ago, the local recurrence rates are actually significantly higher, about 20% or so, uh, in those patients that had a continent neobladder. My own personal take on that, and again, this is just my opinion, not that of anyone else. Uh, personal opinions that this may very well be a situation where as a surgeon you're concentrating on trying to get a continent rhabdo sphincter which allows you or winds up leading you to preserve a little bit more of the urethra than maybe what otherwise and as a result maybe leave a little bit of tumor behind that perhaps you shouldn't have rather than chasing it down a little bit further into the sphincter again this is purely my opinion um, but the, the italian data that's out there does worry me given the local recurrence rates Post-op bladder function on these patients is highly controversial. We know that if you remove the bladder, it's gonna have a negative impact on bladder function. That goes without saying. Uh, we also know though that uh, radiation therapy will negatively impact long-term bladder function. And the problem is we don't know entirely why or how, and that's never been quantified by the Children's Oncology Group, by PSYOP, by the EPSSG or by any other group that's out there. There is currently a wave and a fairly sizable amount of momentum to better quantify that. Given the current focus on survivorship, this is a very hot topic that a lot of folks are, a lot of very good researchers are looking into around the country um, and around the world for that matter. But the reality is, is that we simply don't know what leaving these bladders in situ does long-term to their overall quality of life. In terms of paratosicular tumors, some key points that you want to know here. 80% of these are stage one. In general, these are tumors that tend to do very, very well. 90% of them will have embryonal histology, and these, as a result, have very good outcomes. And the most recent data analysis that, uh, again, I'll be presenting at uh, the SPU meeting in a few weeks here, survival is in excess of 90%. And this is particularly true for younger patients who constitute the grand whopping majority, about two thirds of our patients, are gonna be less than 10 years of age. These are the patients who tend to do better. Um, and so the reality is, is that overall, Paratisigar has amazingly good outcomes and these children tend to do very, very well. Key take home points again, if you have N1 disease or clinically positive nodes, strongly consider doing an RPLMD that is highly recommended by the Children's Oncology Group. If you have a child who is greater than 10 years of age, even if the nodes do not appear to be involved on CT scan or MRI or PET scan or anything else. 
you still need to do an RPLMD. Uh, in our most recent analysis, we found that the majority of patients who actually had node negative disease, or excuse me, who were actually node negative, uh, were actually missed on the original CT scan. So in other words, if you had a CT scan that was negative, that does not necessarily mean that there's no nodal involvement. And if they do have nodal involvement, they're gonna get radiation therapy to their retroperitoneum, again, to establish local regional control. So in order to burn, burn uh, excuse me, bend the survival curve, I cannot encourage you enough. If you have an older boy or a young man with uh, peritonic cigarettomyosarcoma, sarcoma, do the RPLMD. You can do it laparoscopically, you can do it open, you can do it robotically. It doesn't matter how you do it, but consider doing it. Radical ingrown rachiectomy, just to kind of focus on that, again, is the uh, way that we highly recommend doing this. Every year I get to hear about patients who are thought to have a, uh, a hydrocele or something else. Uh, and unfortunately, once a transcrural approach is made, the realization is made on the field, oh goodness, this is something else entirely. That is a problem that can contribute to tumor spill. You always want to get a CT to evaluate the retroperitoneum. And again, RPLND is going to vary based on age. And we know that these children have a very high risk of relapse uh, among adolescents. Um, and also it goes without saying that if you're taking out a testicular tumor, or in this case a paratesticular tumor, please do make sure to bank sperm ahead of time. That is one of the things that uh, adolescent and young adult patients most deeply can, are concerned about uh, when asked after the fact, was there anything about your cancer therapy that you would have had changed? In terms of uh, vagina and uterus, predominantly, these are embryonal histology, and these have an excellent prognosis overall. This is actually a favorable location as well. Organ preservation is strongly preferred. If you can avoid excising the vagina or the uterus, um, or the cervix for that matter, it's strongly preferred to do so. Obviously, there are situations where that may not work, um, and this is a situation where you may want to consider partnering with your radiation oncologist to see is there a way to, for example, pursue brachytherapy as an option. There's actually a fair amount of emerging data, particularly from France and Italy, um, again, that shows that brachytherapy actually has excellent long-term outcomes in these patients, um, as well as bladder prostate patients for that matter as well. And these non-organ preserving surgeries can sometimes be avoided by embracing something a little bit off kilter from what we normally think about. And brachytherapy is not something that we normally think about, but it tends to actually work quite well in experience. So I'll end there and ask what questions can I answer. We've got about 15 or so minutes left uh, to kind of go over things. So anonymous attendee, I put in a while ago that for staging purposes, what if it comes from the vagina? The vagina and the, uh, or the, the vulvovaginal area is considered to be a, a, um, a favorable histology site. And so that would in general be um, a stage one tumor. What are the questions can answer for you guys? All right. What's your opinion of proton therapy? Ultimately, it depends upon what the goal is. Um, there's actually pretty good data. And uh, we, in fact, we just looked at protons versus photons, which is a standard way of administering radiation therapy, obviously, um, in the, the most recent intermediate risk um, uh, study. And in fact, we've looked at this a couple times now. Um, it turns out that there is actually no benefit in terms of survival, in terms of, as best we can tell, long-term side effects to proton therapy. And so uh, if you happen to have proton therapy available, knock yourself out and use it. Um, but don't expect that it's going to make a huge difference in terms of survival or long-term side effects in these patients. Um, so it's, it's a very reasonable modality to consider, but... At this point, there's not a huge survival benefit that's ever been shown, at least in randomized sarcoma. You guys are going easy on me. Anything else? <laughs> 
I should also mention, by the way, um, uh, Michelle has very kindly put up the, uh, the survey link. If you don't mind actually scanning the QR code and filling out a survey afterwards, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. I'm sure Dr. Kopp would in particular particularly appreciate it. All right, any more questions, everyone? All right. Well, again, thank you all very much. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all tonight. Um, if you do have any questions or concerns, my email address is just firstname.lastname at duke.edu, and you're welcome to drop me a line anytime. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about sarcomas or um, I suppose anything else. Sarcoma tends to be a little bit more of an expertise for me, but still. Um, thank you again for the opportunity, everyone, and have a great night.